Howdy, folks. I wanted to talk with you about an argument for infant baptism that I think tends to be overlooked. Now, there are multiple lines of evidence that favor infant baptism, such as the fact that we see multiple examples of household baptism in the New Testament, and some of those households likely included small children. We also have multiple statements from early church fathers attesting to infant baptism as something that came from the apostles. And we have cases like St. Polycarp of Smyrna, who was martyred around A.D. 155 and had been born around A.D. 69, within the apostolic age. At the time of his martyrdom, he said that he had served Christ, or been a Christian, for 86 years, which would place his baptism when he was an infant. Then there's the fact that in Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, St. Paul describes baptism as the circumcision of Christ, meaning the Christian equivalent of circumcision, and circumcision was applied to babies when they were eight days old. In fact, around A.D. 253, there was a council in Carthage, North Africa, where the fathers debated whether baptism should be done on the eighth day after birth, and their answer was no. Infant mortality was so high at the time that they held that you shouldn't wait until the eighth day. St. Cyprian of Carthage was at the council and he wrote about it. Recently, a friend of mine had a new baby, which is awesome. And my friend happens to belong to a Credo Baptist church, which means that they don't baptize until a person is old enough to make a profession of faith. He was open to discussing the matter, though, and after our initial conversation, I was thinking about it, and it struck me that the issue is a whole lot easier to sort out if you get one question settled first. What does baptism do? Let's take a look back at what Cyprian of Carthage wrote about the council. He was writing to a man named Phidus, and he said, as to what pertains to the case of infants, you, Phidus, said that they ought not be baptized within the second or third day after their birth, that the old law of circumcision must be taken into consideration, and that you did not think that one should be baptized and sanctified within the eighth day after his birth. So Phidus wanted to wait until the eighth day. In our council, it seemed to us far otherwise. No one agreed to the course which you thought should be taken. Rather, we all judge that the mercy and grace of God ought not to be denied to no man born. So Cyprian and his fellow council fathers believed that baptism is a means of grace, that God uses baptism to put his grace into our souls. This is in contrast to the view that some have of baptism as a purely symbolic ritual that doesn't do anything. It seems to me that this is a key distinction that has implications for whether we should baptize infants. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of an early Christian who believes that baptism communicates God's grace. If you're a parent, you want God's grace working in your child's soul as soon as possible, especially if you're living in an age where infant mortality is high. So you want to baptize your child, and the only reason you would not baptize your child is if you had a specific command telling you otherwise. But there is no such command in Scripture, and so early Christians baptized their children. Now, put yourself in the position of a Christian who believes that baptism is not a means of grace, that it's only a symbolic act that doesn't objectively do anything. Supposing, once again, that you're a parent, what should you do for your child? If you believe baptism won't help your child in any way, won't give him or her grace, then it would be reasonable to wait until your child has gotten old enough to confess the Christian faith for himself. Since there also isn't an explicit command in the Bible saying that you must baptize your child earlier than that. Now, as I've said, I think there are both biblical and patristic indicators that infant baptism is an apostolic institution. But setting that aside, it seems to me that in the absence of an explicit command one way or the other in the Bible, that a key factor in the decision is the question of what baptism does. If it's a means of grace, then we want to baptize our children as soon as possible, and nothing in the Bible says to wait until they're older. On the other hand, if it's a purely symbolic act, then it could be reasonable to wait, since we also don't have an explicit command to baptize early. 
To help sort out the issue of infant baptism, we thus should look at the question of what baptism does. And when we do that, we find abundant testimony in the Bible that baptism is a means of grace. It's not just a ritual. It communicates God's graces, such as the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus, Peter told the crowd on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Similarly, when he was converted to the faith, Paul was told, Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. In Romans, Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we receive new life through baptism. In his letters, Peter explicitly connected baptism with salvation, comparing baptism to how eight people were saved in Noah's Ark. He writes, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism now saves you is about as clear as it gets. Of course, baptism doesn't save us because it makes us physically cleaner, he says. Rather, it now saves you because it involves an appeal to God for a clear conscience. And that clear conscience, one purged of the guilt of sin, is granted to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament also indicates that baptism is the means by which we're regenerated or born again. Jesus taught, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This verse was universally understood among the early church fathers as referring to baptism. And St. Paul agrees with baptismal regeneration, saying that God saved us not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Baptism thus places us in the state of salvation, and the early Christians clearly recognized this. For example, in the mid-2nd century, about A.D. 150, St. Justin Martyr wrote, Whoever are convinced and believe that what they are taught and told by us is the truth and profess to be able to live accordingly, are instructed to pray and to beseech God in fasting for the remission of their former sins, while we pray and fast with them. Then they are led by us to a place where there is water, and they are reborn in the same kind of rebirth in which we ourselves were reborn. In the name of God, the Lord and Father of all, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they receive the washing of water. For Christ said, Unless you are reborn, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I won't quote other early church fathers here, but they are absolutely unified in the belief that baptism is a means of grace. One of the few things on which the church fathers are truly unanimous is baptismal regeneration. It's thus no surprise that the historic forms of Christianity that preceded the Reformation all believe in baptismal regeneration and practice infant baptism. They inherited it from the earliest ages. This is true of the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, the Assyrian Church of the East, and so on. It's also true of the majority of Protestant churches as well. Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration and thus practice infant baptism. So do Anglicans and Methodists and even Presbyterians who acknowledge that baptism is the means of regeneration for elect infants and thus baptize them. The majority of Christians all through history and even today thus believe in baptism as a means of grace and practice infant baptism. It's really only Baptists and those who have been influenced by Baptists that reject this. So it seems to me that if you're trying to sort out the issue of infant baptism, a good first step is sorting out the issue of whether, as Christians have historically believed, baptism is a means of grace 
or whether it's only symbolic. If it's the former, then we want God's grace operating in our children's souls as soon as possible, and only a positive command not to baptize them would warrant us to not do so. In light of the evidence that we have from the Bible and the early church fathers, I think that the evidence that baptism is a means of grace is rock solid. That's why the church fathers were so unanimous on this issue. By the way, if you like this content, you can help me out. I'm trying to grow my channel, and you can help by liking, commenting on, and sharing the video so that the YouTube algorithm will know that you found it engaging and more people will see it. Also, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a video. These days, I have multiple videos coming out each week. Thanks very much. I really appreciate your help, and God bless you.